So thank you very much, uh, and uh, thanks again for uh, Dr. Crawford. It's really a pr privilege to be here, and it's an amazing meeting. So neuroendocrine cells are actually part of the normal prostate. It, we can detect them in benign prostate as well. <coughs> if you do the right staining, this is with chromogranin A and synaptophysin. Uh, they're probably uh, part of the normal, uh, they are part of the normal architecture of the prostate. They are in the basal cell comp compartment. They have dendritic cells and they play a regulatory role uh, via their uh, neurotrophic neuropeptides, bombesin, calcitonin, serotonin, PTH, VGF, and so forth and so on. Those are terminally differentiated cells, uh, so they don't have a proliferative capacity uh, and they express anti apoptotic uh, uh, factors. But the neuroendocrine cells can uh, come and present themselves as a prostate cancer tumor. The extreme case, uh, which I would not talk much about, is the primary de novo, uh, if you will, neuroendocrine prostate cancer. This is a very rare disease, less than 1% of prostate cancer patients, uh, usually in the form of small cell carcinoma of the prostate. There's sometimes large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma or carcinoid. There are different and new uh, pathological uh, um, classifications. Um, it's, it's phenotyped by frequent visceral and bulky soft tissue metastasis, uh, lytic bone lesion, and they are usually responding early, uh, but for a, a short time, to cytotoxic chemotherapy, um, cisplatin or carboplatin in combination with taxins. They, have a, they do not secrete PSA, they have very low levels of PSA, but high levels of another surrogate marker, the uh, chromogranin A. But the interesting is what happens with neuroendocrine cells during the evolution of prostate cancer. So as I mentioned here on the left, you can see uh, normal neuroendocrine uh, cells within benign prostate. They are in, any, uh, in every homo-naive adenocarcinoma, they are neuroendocrine cells that are residing there. And, uh, and I'll show you in about 25% at least of patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer, if you look for that, you will find it unless it will express itself by frank neuroendocrine carcinoma, and that has a prognostic significance uh, and a special clinical entity which I'll talk about. So neuroendocrine differentiation in homo-naive prostate cancer, up to 10% of prostatic adenocarcinoma contain clusters uh, and aggregates of neuroendocrine-like malignant cells. We call it nor focal neuroendocrine differentiation. They have uh, a same um, um, genetic uh, uh, material, if you will, or genetic origin from the neighboring adenocarcinoma cells, and we'll talk about the uh, ERG rearrangement. Um, and their prognosis, uh, their presence there is unclear in terms of prognosis. But what's very interesting, I think that would be the, 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 the topic today, is the secondary development of neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So it has been estimated that about 25% of lethal prostate cancers are uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer in, in large phenotype. Uh, and it's a trans differentiation actually from adenocarcinoma cells, probably due to epithelial plasticity because of selective pressure. And the selective pressure is androgen deprivation um, and uh, the more the merrier, if you will, and cytotoxic chemotherapy. There's also some thought that they do have a, com uh, they have a common progenitor as the, androgen at the, as the adenocarcinoma cells. I won't get too much into that. The interesting thing is those neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells are resistant to ADT, and uh, they actually can act as an inner um, stimulant for tumorigenicity because they act as, uh, as a source for prior crime uh, um, uh, signals um, via their uh, secretion of serotonin, uh, and bombesin, calcitonin, et cetera, and we'll talk about that. So how common is that? Uh, this is a, actually uh, from an abstract uh, that uh, was presented in ASCO in 2014. I couldn't follow that with a paper, actually paper, but that was a very interesting uh, um, um, study. They looked at archival uh, um, material from metastatic prostate biopsy sites and, and stained it for, uh, um, um, uh, with, with neuroendocrine markers. And you can see that um, they exclude the uh, uh, small cell carcinoma, but you can see that up to 50% of the tumors or the, the metastatic deposits showed positive staining for neuroendocrine markers. Um, so 44, and, and that was also um, observed in 44% of the hormone sensitive cases and up to 56% of the castration resistant prostate cancer. So it's a very, very common thing. You can add to that the observation that circulating tumor cells from patients with neuroendocrine prostate cancer uh, are identified in about 10% or 11% of castration-resistant prostate cancer patients. So it's there. 
Does it have prognostic significance? It seems to be uh, true when you talk about castration resistant prostate cancer. This is just one example, a Japanese study looking at uh, 28 patients with castration resistant prostate cancer at the time of progression. Uh, and they uh, showed uh, in a multivariate analysis that the lack of androgen receptors and a strong noroendocrine differentiation um, um, staining were related to adverse prognosis uh, once castration resistant prostate cancer occurred. So not only it's there, it's important. So this is a very interesting observation. So we know that the uh, ERG gene rearrangement is a kind of a hallmark of adenocarcinoma, genetic uh, um, phenotype, uh, um, genetic uh, uh, genotyping, if you will, of prostate cancer, adenocarcinoma, but that actually exists in noroendocrine cells. And this is actually an example on the extreme uh, uh, um, uh, uh, end of noroendocrine differentiation of small cell carcinoma. So this uh, uh, um, study looked at small cell carcinoma of the lung, small cell carcinoma of the bladder, and small cell carcinoma of the prostate. And only in small cell carcinoma of the prostate, this uh, ERG uh, gene rearrangement uh, was uh, um, present. So this finding supports a very common origin for atinar adenocarcinoma and small cell carcinoma, or, in, or if you will, noroendocrine carcinoma of the prostate. So let's go through the uh, evolutionary transformation of classic adenocarcinoma uh, to a noroendocrine cancer. So as uh, you saw bef uh, above in the, in, in, in the, in the histological staining, um, you have it in benign prostate, then you have it in um, homo-naive prostate cancer, and that shows rearrangement of the tims erg uh, uh, gene, supporting a common, uh, a, a common origin. But then, with the development of castration-resistant prostate cancer or through the evolution of uh, uh, prostate cancer, you can see that there are typical changes, genetic changes that uh, would uh, explain the aggressiveness of this uh, tumor. So first, there is the loss of AR so, and androgen-regulated genes. Noroendocrine prostate cancer cells do not express the androgen receptor. Now, with that, after that, comes the induction of noroendocrine and neural program, and that is, uh, is accompanied by first loss of tumor suppression, so t t uh, P53, uh, R um, RB1 uh, are commonly or, or uh, <coughs> deleted or, or suppressed in noroendocrine commerce, uh, prostate cancer, which leads to genomic instability, and on top of that, the final hit is the upregulation of Aura Canas A, which we'll talk about, and MIC amplification, which results in a significant mitotic activation. So those are specific molecular pathways which the androgen deprivation therapy could not touch. And I'll give you an example here is this study that uh, we did actually back when I, I was doing my uh, PhD. Um, so this is, we used to take a prostate cancer tissue from patients, implant them into a mice, and try to uh, uh, develop a different unique xenograft. So this one, we call it the WISH PC2, Weizmann Institute Shiba Hospital PC2. This was from a patient uh, that had a very aggressive uh, adenocarcinoma of the prostate, uh, treated uh, long-term with hormones. Uh, we took the uh, tumors, we implanted it in, into a mice, and what you can actually see is that this uh, um, xenograft developed into uh, a small cell or noroendocrine prostate cancer. Now, interestingly enough, you could see that if you treated these mice with a testosterone, the tumor still, although it did not have the androgen receptor, still got uh, bigger, okay? So it grew faster. And this is very interesting because, and this would potentially talk about the fact that we still need to uh, give androgen deprivation therapy to these patients because it's always a bit of a mix between adenocarcinoma and noroendocrine prostate cancer cells. And uh, the uh, effect of androgens can affect the, um, uh, the surrounding stroma and that would feed back to the prostate cancer cells, for example, um, through via VGF, VGF and so forth. So there's still some advantage of uh, castration in these uh, tumors. Um, um, and this has been shown here. Uh, this is a classical noroendocrine prostate cancer. You can see that if you implant it to, into a, a mouse prostate, you develop a, a, a tumor, a noroendocrine tumor, which completely replaces the tumor. It can cause liver metastasis, uh, and which is typical as a visceral metastasis. It's, you can see uh, here that it can, uh, if you put it into the uh, tibia, it, it induced uh, lytic, typical lytic uh, bone lesions. Uh, what's not shown here is that this uh, uh, tumor model actually secretes chromogranin A, which is a surrogate and, uh, and correlate with the tumor volume. 
So trans differentiation uh, from epithelial-like phenotype to a neuroendocrine-like phenotype can be a consequence of treatment-induced selective pressure, and I think this is a very important point. So we are creating in our own hands the neuroendocrine prostate cancer, and I, I believe it is really my belief that we'll see more and more and more of those with all of the uh, manipulation that uh, uh, Neil uh, uh, described to you. Let's see how that works. Okay, so this is a classical uh, work uh, looking at LENCAP cells. Those are cells, prostate cancer cells that have the androgen receptor. And if you deplete uh, androgen, um, you will induce neuroendocrine differentiation. If you will restore androgens, you will suppress the neuroendocrine differentiation. Um, and what's very interesting, and I think it's very relevant to, in our era, is that you can, um, the, the, in the, there is an acquisition of neuroendocrine phenotypes in prostate cancer cells that can be induced by chronic exposure to docetaxel. So it's not only the androgens, you can actually pressure cells or prostate cancer cells to become neuroendocrine cells. How does that happen? There are many explanations. This is one example. Androgen inhibit REST. Uh, REST is a gene that actually regulates neuroendocrine differentiation of, uh, uh, of prostate cancer cells. In this example, it's LENCAP cells. And you can see that if you uh, add, um, <coughs> if you um, silence the uh, REST, there is no uh, androgen, uh, neuroendocrine differentiation. If you add uh, androgens, that does the same. So, and here is uh, on the uh, left, you can see uh, an array of, uh, uh, of genes that relate to neuroendocrine differentiation. And uh, you can see that, um, <coughs> that REST induces them. And when you uh, uh, abolish androgens, you can see that REST is, is, uh, uh, is inhibited. And therefore, you get, again, the phenotype of, and, uh, androgen, uh, sorry, of adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> I'll skip that one. So um, here's another thing. Okay, so we deprive androgens from adenocarcinoma, from a very aggressive adenocarcinoma cells. So we are treating actually the uh, exocrine prostatic cancer cells, the adenocarcinoma cells. But we leave behind the neuroendocrine cells that they can actually act as an inner engine, engine because these cells secrete significant trophic uh, factors, such as, for example, bombesin, serotonin, uh, PTHRP. So not only that uh, we are not targeting the neuroendocrine cells that do not have the androgen receptor, we actually leave them uh, to secrete their trophic um, uh, signals, which can act on the uh, adenocarcinoma cells uh, in an androgen-independent pathways. And this is just one example here. Uh, you can see that neuroendocrine cells in a benign uh, prostate uh, uh, or, or adenocarcinoma um, do secrete the uh, IL-8, for example. This works on the CXCR2, and that activates the P53. But the thing is that with neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells, there is no P53. So what you're left with is a vicious circle of autocrine uh, proliferation. So what do we do with that? So uh, this is a, a very uh, nice uh, paper and a very nice, actually, uh, I think, lifelong work uh, by the group of uh, uh, Mark Rubin and, uh, uh, and Dr. Beltran. And they looked at the, the molecular characterization of neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells. Uh, and what's very interesting, and I'll just give that, because this is, I think, the bottom line, is that Aura kinase A and uh, MIC uh, N are over amplified in uh, clinical specimens with uh, neuroendocrine cells. Now, the interesting thing is that it goes early on as in unselective, um, unselected, if you will, primary prostate cancer to primary prostate cancer patients who progress to neuroendocrine prostate cancer. And you can see the gene amplification of both the Aura kinase A and MIC. So it's a very, very, very common. Look at what happens in metastatic. Um, um, treatment-induced neuroendocrine prostate cancer. And treatment-induced pro neuroendocrine prostate cancer means it's a disease that we induced with our androgen deprivation therapy. It's highly, highly uh, overexpressed. Here's another example. Orokinase overexpression in primary prostatic adenocarcinoma patient who developed progression to neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells. So it's actually there even before the development of castration-resistant prostate cancer and neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So it's early on within the patients who are destined to develop neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Um, MIC-N is a proto-oncogen that encodes for the transcription factor, which uh, regulates, uh, which is 
in, 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 in normal physiology, if you will, is important in early embryogenesis for neural stem cells. But it is up-regulated uh, in neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells um, and causing the uh, proliferative effect and the, the uh, differentiation to neuroendocrine tissues. And the interesting thing is that the our uh, kinase A, which is a cell cycle regulator, it works in, uh, on the assembly of the mitotic spindle apparatus, so the chromosomal separation in the mitosis. This stabilizes mic ends, so they go up together. And our kinase A, I think, is the hallmark, at least from what I can understand now in the biology of neuroendocrine prostate cancer in the development of this lethal disease. And you can see it here again. And this is important because there is a specific tar a drug that can target the aurokinase A. Um, this is the, uh, uh, <coughs> was uh, licensed, to, uh, licensed uh, with uh, a Takeda. Uh, the name is uh, al Alciratib. Um, and that has been shown in preclinical uh, studies by Beltran et al., which is a beautiful uh, uh, study, to show that it can inhibit significantly uh, or, or treat neuroendocrine prostate cancer on the basis of the fact that our canase A is overexpressed in, um, or <coughs> in uh, neuroendocrine tumors and actually also in adenocarcinoma cells that are destined to become neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells. So um, this is the uh, clinical trial that uh, was uh, recruiting. It's an orally administered orokinase A inhibitor given uh, orally 50 milligrams twice daily for seven days and repeat a cycle in 21 days. They did a study uh, which looked at uh, open label phase two trial, mainly uh, looking at progression. Um, the problem was, and that the, this uh, has been uh, presented in ESMO in 2016, now the, 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 the uh, recent ESMO, showing that um, um, it, had, it had an effect, but that was kind of a limited effect. So about three, three patients out of the 60 had a complete response or significant response, um, but uh, the uh, progression to um, um, radiology progression in six months was quite high, uh, and the progression-free survival in six months was only 15%. Uh, they explained it in the fact that they were not really enriched for neuroendocrine uh, prostate cancer, uh, but I think uh, this is a very interesting drug, and I think um, th because uh, our kind of A amplification is also presenting in a primary adenocarcinoma of the prostate and can predict late stage development of neuroendocrine prostate cancer and castration resistant prostate cancer, perhaps. Um, one can envision the uh, integration of, of uh, aurokinase A inhibitor early on uh, before the disease is full blown, um, and this is something that uh, uh, is of interest. So um, to wrap up, just to give you what I call a, 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 a cognitive doggy bag, if you will, a take-home message, I think uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer develops from adenocarcinoma of the prostate, okay? Um, this process is, results from a selective pressure and please be aware that this, we, are, we are inducing it in our own hands. This is the uh, uh, trade-off of this sophisticated, deep castration, as well as the addition now of cytotoxic agent, and it involves specific molecular pathways, uh, and if you have to remember one, please remember the Aurokan SA. Um, there is an increased uh, incidence of neuroendocrine prostate cancer in the current era of novel ADT agent, uh, which is suspected. I didn't see really uh, hard data on that. Uh, and if we have to, we have to compare it to historical control. Um, and they have their own selective advantages. And one, and one thing perhaps to target them is to target their own secretion, which fuels up the neighboring adenocarcinoma cells by virtue of their uh, uh, paracrine factors. Uh, and there is potential targeted therapy, Arucan as inhibitors, which I think needs to be uh, um, used uh, more selectively. Thank you.